capital accumulation is the dynamic that motivates the pursuit of profit, involving the investment of money or any financial asset with the goal of increasing the initial monetary value of said asset is a financial return, whether in the form of profit, rent, interest, royalties or capital gains. The process of capital accumulation forms the basis of capitalism and is one of the defining characteristics of a capitalist economic system. In a more broad sense, capital accumulation may refer to the gathering or amassing of any objects of value as judged by one's perceived reproductive interest group. Definition the definition of capital accumulation is subject to controversy and ambiguities because it could refer to a net addition to existing wealth, a redistribution of wealth. Dot. Most often, capital accumulation involves both a net addition and a redistribution of wealth, which may raise a question of who really benefits from it most. If more wealth is produced than there was before, where society becomes richer, the total stock of wealth increases. But if some accumulate capital only at the expense of others, wealth is merely shifted from A to B. It is also possible that some accumulate capital much faster than others. In principle, it is possible that a few people or organizations accumulate capital and grow richer, although the total stock of wealth of society decreases. In economics and accounting capital accumulation is often equated with investment of profit income or savings, especially in real capital goods. The concentration and centralization of capital are two of the results of such accumulation. Capital accumulation refers ordinarily to real investment in tangible means of production, such as acquisitions, research and development, etc., that can increase the capital flow. Investment in financial assets represented on paper, yielding profit, interest, rent, royalties, fees or capital gains. Investment in non-productive physical assets such as residential real estate or works of art that appreciate in value and by extension to human capital i e new education and training increasing the skills of the labor force which can increase earnings from work social capital i e the wealth and productive capacity that the people in a society hold in common rather than as individuals or corporations etc dot both non-financial and financial capital accumulation is usually needed for economic growth, since additional production usually requires additional funds to enlarge the scale of production. Smarter and more productive organization of production can also increase production without increased capital. Capital can be created without increased investment by inventions or improved organization that increase productivity, discovery of new assets, the sale of property, etc. In modern macroeconomics and econometrics the term capital formation is often used in preference to accumulation, though the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development refers nowadays to accumulation. The term is occasionally used in national accounts. The measurement of accumulation. Accumulation can be measured as the monetary value of investments, the amount of income that is reinvested, or as the change in the value of assets own. Using company balance sheets, tax date when direct surveys as a basis, government statisticians estimate total investments and assets for the purpose of national accounts, national balance of payments and flow of funds statistics. Usually the Reserve Banks and the Treasury provide interpretations and analysis of this data. Standard indicators include capital formation, gross fixed capital formation, fixed capital, household asset wealth, and foreign direct investment. 
organizations such as the International Monetary Fund, UNCTAD, the World Bank Group, the OECD, and the Bank for International Settlements use national investment data to estimate world trends. The Bureau of Economic Analysis, Eurostat and the Japan Statistical Office provide data on the USA, Europe and Japan respectively. Other useful sources of investment information are business magazines such as Fortune, Forbes, The Economist, Business Week, etc., and various corporate watchdog organizations and non-governmental organization publications. A reputable scientific journal is the Review of Income in AMP Wealth. In the case of the USA, the Analytical Perspectives document provides useful wealth and capital estimates applying to the whole country, capital accumulation and military wars. Wars typically causes the diversion, destruction and creation of capital assets as capital assets are both destroyed or consumed and diverted to types of production needed to fight the war. Many assets are wasted and in some few cases created specifically to fight a war. War-driven demands may be a powerful stimulus for the accumulation of capital and production capability in limited areas and market expansion, outside the immediate theater of war. Often this has induced laws against perceived and real war profiteering. The total hours worked in the United States rose by 34% during World War II. Even though the military draft reduced the civilian labor force by 11%, War destruction can be illustrated by looking at World War II. Industrial war damage was heaviest in Japan, where one quarter of factory buildings and one third of plant and amp equipment were destroyed. One seventh of electric power generating capacity was destroyed and six sevenths of oil refining capacity. The Japanese merchant fleet lost 80% of the ships. In Germany in 1944, when air attacks were heaviest, 6.5% of machine tools were damaged or destroyed, but around 90% were later repaired. About 10% of steel production capacity was lost. In Europe, the United States and the Soviet Union enormous resources were accumulated and ultimately dissipated as planes ships, tanks, etc., were built and then lost or destroyed. Germany's total war damage was estimated at about 17.5% of the pre-war total capital stock by value I, e about one-sixth. In the Berlin area alone, there were 8 million refugees lacking basic necessities. In 1945, less than 10% of the railways were still operating. 2,395 rail bridges were destroyed and a total of 7,500 bridges, 10,000 locomotives and more than 100,000 goods wagons were destroyed. Less than 40% of the remaining locomotives were operational. However, by the first quarter of 1946 European rail traffic, which was given assistance and preferences for resources and material as an essential asset, regained its pre-war operational level. At the end of the year, 90% of Germany's railway lines were operating again. In retrospect, the rapidity of infrastructure reconstruction appears astonishing. Initially, in May 1945, newly installed U.S. President Harry S. Truman's directive had been that no steps would be taken towards economic rehabilitation of Germany. In fact, the initial industry plan of 1946 prohibited production in excess of half of the 1938 level. The iron and steel industry was allowed to produce only less than a third of pre-war output. These plans were rapidly revised and better plans were instituted. In 1946, over 10% of Germany's physical capital stock was also dismantled and confiscated, most of it going to the USSR. By 1947, industrial production in Germany was at one-third of the 1938 level, and industrial investment at about one-half the 1938 level. 
The first big strike wave in the Ruhr occurred in early 1947. It was about food rations and housing, but soon there were demands for nationalization. The U.S. appointed military governor however stated at the time that he had the power to break strikes by withholding food rations. The clear message was, no work, no eat, as the military controls in western Germany were nearly all relinquished and the Germans were allowed to rebuild their own economy with Marshall Plan. Aid things rapidly improved. By 1951, German industrial production had overtaken the pro-war level. The Marshall Aid funds were important, but, after the currency reform and the establishment of a new political system, much more important was the commitment of the USA to rebuilding German capitalism and establishing a free market economy and government. Rather than keeping Germany in a weak position, initially average real wages remained low lower even than in 1938, until the early 1950s, while profitability was unusually high. So the total investment fund, aided by credits, was also high, resulting in a high rate of capital accumulation which was nearly all reinvested in new construction and new tools. This was called the German Economic Miracle or Wirtschaft's Wonder. In Italy, the victorious allies did three things in 1945. They imposed their absolute military authority. They quickly disarmed the Italian partisans from a very large stock of weapons, and they agreed to a state guarantee of wage payments, as well as a veto on all sackings of workers from the jobs. Although the Italian Communist Party grew very large immediately after the war ended, it achieved a membership of 1.7 million people in a population of 45 million. It was outmaneuvered through a complicated political battle by the Christian Democrats. After three years, in the 1950s, an economic boom began in Italy, at first fueled by internal demand, and then also by exports. In the United States in World War II the large investments in industrial plant necessitated by the war brought big advantages, but the costs of debt, waste and debt would have never been undertaken by any rational government for the slight advantages. In modern times, it has often been possible to rebuild build physical capital assets destroyed in wars completely within the space of about 10 years, except in cases of severe pollution by chemical warfare or other kinds of irreparable devastation. However, damage to human capital has been much more devastating, in terms of fatalities, permanent physical disability, enduring ethnic hostility and psychological injuries which have effects for at least several generations.